Okay, so let's start then. Uh, so it's a really a pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Rocco Lico. Uh, Lico is coming from Bologna, where he, he did his PhD. He defended his PhD in December 2015, and he, uh, his advisor was uh, Gabriele Giovannini, and his co-advisor uh, was uh, Marcello Gigoletti. Uh, uh, Rocco has been uh, working in uh, mainly on a particular uh, class of blazers, which are known as uh, uh, high synchrotron peaked uh, blazers, from a multi wavelength point of view. So, uh, trying to connect uh, the radio and optical and gamma rays uh, to figure out what is the emission mechanism. And this very well, uh, very um, uh, uh, um, specific uh, class of uh, blazer that is. Uh, is, uh, is not so well known as the, as the other type of uh, blazer. And today, so he's going to uh, discuss uh, some of the physical and statistical properties of this uh, blazer population. Okay. Thank you for introducing me, Jose, and uh, let me thank you for hosting me here during these days and for giving me this opportunity of giving a talk uh, today. As Jose mentioned, um, I'm here working with Jose about some polarization analysis of a specific source but today I'm just going to talk about general properties of this very peculiar class of sources, which are asynchronous picket blazers. And uh, I will uh, introduce in general, uh, very briefly, AGNs and blazers. Then I will introduce the, this very peculiar class of objects, which are the asynchronous picket blazers. And then I will mainly talk about um, re uh, recent work that we did looking for a possible connection between radio and gamma ray emission in these objects. Of course, I'm going to also explain why we're looking exactly in those two emitting beds. Then, if we have time, I will talk about this special case of Martel 421, which is one of the most representative sources of this uh, uh, subclass, but only if we have time. Okay, this is. Um, <laughs> One slide introduction to AGNs, uh, just for those people who are not familiar with uh, such sources. Let me say that AGNs represents a tiny fraction of galaxies in the universe. So, roughly 1% of galaxies in the universe are active galaxies, in the sense that they host an active galactic nucleus, which uh, is represent, represents the central region of uh, such galaxies and has a luminosity which is much more higher than the luminosity of the hosting galaxy itself. The best properties of uh, AGNs are this one, so the best ingredients, the basic ingredients. The, the first one is the presence of a supermassive black hole uh, acting as a central engine. Uh, when I say supermassive, I mean a black hole with a mass higher than 10 to 6 solar masses, up to 10 to 10, 10 to 11 solar masses, which acts as a central engine and accretes the matter around in a, an accretion disk, who is mainly responsible of the optical and UV emission that we observe in the spectra of AGNs, here in the central regions. Then, going far away, we have um, a region of uh, move strong uh, and turbulent moving gas clouds, which produce uh, broad and prominent emission lines in their uh, optical spectra, mainly from permitted transitions. And uh, going farther away, we have another region like this, which is the narrow line region, producing now only narrow emission lines, both from permitted and uh, forbidden transitions. And the main difference is the density in those two regions. At an intermediate distance, we have uh, we find a dusty torus, which uh, extend, let's say, from roughly one parsec up to one hundred parsec from the central uh, region, and absorbs the optical emission from the innermost regions and re emits this emission at infrared wavelengths, so it's responsible of the infrared emission that we observe in the optical spectra. And only in few cases, those sources are able to produce uh, uh, bipolar plasma flows in opposite direction, originating in the central uh, region and then extending uh, up to, let's say, from few parsec up to few megaparsec. And in this case, we are talking about only about 10% of AGNs. As you can see, such structure is highly directional. So if, for example, we look at the structure in this direction at larger open angle, we can see that the dusty torus hides the, inner, the in emission of the innermost regions, while on the other way, if we look in this direction, we 
can feel their like mystic boosting effects and so on. So this is just to say that according to the viewing angle of such structure of an AGN, we have different manifestation of the AGNs and so we have a classification according to these geometrical effects. So today I'm not going to talk about this, so this is just outside of the scope of this talk, but this is just to say that uh, we have different sources according to the viewing angle and the sources we are interested in are those sources which are able to produce relativistic jets and with the relativistic jets which is closely aligned to our line of sight. So we have these two bipolar plasma flows just going in our direction. Such sources are called blazers and show uh, a prominent radio emission. They are defined as radio loud uh, objects. In the definition is that the ratio between the 5 gigahertz to the optical B-band flux ratio is uh, higher than 10. So just to say that they show a prominent uh, radio emission. And being these relativistic jets made of particles moving at relativistic speeds in our direction, of course, they are affected by relativistic boosting. And so what we observe, if the observer is here, is just an amplified brightness, an amplified brightness temperature. This is the Doppler factor, let's say it's a kind of amplification factor, which depends on the viewing angle and on the Lorentz factor of uh, the source. While this is for the approaching jet, while in the other case, for the receiving jet, we have, of, of course, the opposite, so a dead boosting, and in, in fact, in blazers, we just observe one silent jet, just because this one is the boosted, the counter jet. Other peculiar properties of blazers are that they show very rapid variability on time scales from uh, days uh, to few hours, and it's also usual to uh, find in these relativistic jets apparent superluminal motion, which are quite common in blazers. Their emission is uh, mainly non thermal and they show also a high degree of radio and optical polarization, uh, up to 20%, which allows us to obtain important information on the topology and on the structure of the magnetic field in such sources. And then another important thing is that such sources are strong gamma ray emitters. We are going to talk uh, about this uh, later, in much deeper in the next slides. So, I would say we are talking about blazers, which represent some kind of fraction of AGN and of galaxies in the universe, but they are very peculiar. This is the spectral energy distribution of blazers, uh, which is, um, let's say, the ID card of blazers. Because when we look at the SED of one blazer, we usually can identify two non-thermal components extending throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. The, fir the first not low energy non-thermal component is uh, produced by synchrotron emission from uh, relativistic electrons within the jet, while the high energy component is thought to be produced by inverse quantum scattering of the electrons within the jet together with uh, surrounding low energy photons. According to the origin of such low energy photons, we have different emission mechanisms. For example, in the case such low energy photons are the same photons produced by the synchrotron emission. We talk about synchrotron self quantum model. While if such low energy photons are just external photons, uh, let's say maybe photons coming from the accretion disk or the broad binary region or by, from the dusty cores, we talk about a different mechanism which is the external quantum. In general, blazers, uh, commonly blazers, are classified according to the properties of their optical spectrum. So, depending on the presence or not of strong emission lines, in general, in their optical spectra, they are classified into BLAC object and fast spectrum radio quasars. Also, people who are not familiar with such sources may have heard about such uh, classification. So, in the first panel, we have a spectrum of a BLAC object. As you can see, BLACs only show very weak emission lines, or in some cases, really featureless spectra. While in the other case of fast spectrum radio quasar, we have prominent and broad emission lines. So this is just the first classification, but this is not the only subclassification of blazers. There is another classification which is based on the uh, spectral energy distribution properties, in particular on the position of the peak of the first non-thermal component, the synchrotron component. Whether the peak of the synchrotron component 
is found at frequencies lower than 10 to 14 Hz, they are classified as low synchrotron picket blazers. While well speak is found at frequencies higher than 10 to 15 Hz, they are classified as high synchrotron picket blazers, which actually are the sources we are interested in, and we are introducing them here now for the first time. And then we have an intermediate class for the sources whose, peak, uh, whose synchrotron peak falls in between 10 to 14 and 10 to 15 Hz. What this plot is telling us, which is known as blazer sequence, is that when the ratio between the radio and total power increases, both the low energy and high energy peaks shift to lower frequencies. And so we have the low synchrotron picket blazers representing the most powerful uh, blazers. While the high synchrotron picket blazers, we, which are not so powerful, but they are able to emit up to very high energy domain, so up to TV energies. So for this, they are very interesting because they allow us to investigate the behavior of the emission mechanism in some of the most extreme environments. And just to give you an idea, in this plot, BLX are here in this region, so let's say, oh, sorry, <laughs> flat spectrum radio quasars are in general of low synchrotron picket type, while BLX are in general of high synchrotron picket type. So this is just a general behavior, but of course it's not always like this. There also are some intermediate um, objects. Okay, uh, we talked about AGS, we talked about blazers, we introduced high synchrotron picket blazers. Let's have now a um, deeper look on such sources and let's try to understand why uh, such sources are interesting. Although we are only talking about a really tiny fraction of sources in the universe, because as we mentioned before, AGNs are only roughly 1% of galaxies in the universe. Sources which are able to produce a jet represent only roughly 10% of AGNs, and high synchrotron picket blazers is a subclass of blazers. So we are really talking about tiny fraction of sources, but those sources are very interesting for several reasons. As we mentioned before, the first reason is that being those sources strong TV emitters, so such uh, sources are the best candidate for being TV emitters. In fact, among all of the known TV blazers, more of 70% of them are of high synchrotron ticket type. So they allow us to investigate the behavior and the mission mechanism in some of the most extreme environments. And then they have some peculiar properties, like for example, very fast variability. So at very high energies in particular, they show a fast variability with a time scale of the order of a few minutes. And they also have uh, show peculiar VLBI properties. As I mentioned before, in, it's, it's common to find apparent superluminal motion in blazers, but this is not common in high synchrotron picket blazers. So in general, no motion is found within their atomistic jet, so no superluminal motion, and they only require modest Doppler factors, as well as they only show mod, not extreme brightness temperature values, and in some cases, they show some peculiar properties like uh, limb brightening structure, as well as transverse structure of the electrovector position angle, indicating that, at least in such sources, that might be a transverse structure uh, in the jet. Okay, so for all of these reasons, they are quite important. Another reason why it's worth uh, studying such sources is uh, uh, to obtain uh, indirect measure, um, um, how do you say, measurements on the extragalactic background light. I mean, so the EBL. The EBL after CMB is uh, the most dominant cosmological radiation field in the universe, which is, contains the diffuse emission of stars and galaxies since they formed. But actually, it's very difficult to make direct measurements on the EBL, mainly because of the foreground contamination. So mainly because of the strong foreground contribution of the zodiacal light and of stars in our galaxy. And asynchrotron picket braces provide us with uh, a good and, and direct method for give, obtaining information on the EBL. How can we do this? So this is because the very high energy spectra of asynchrotron picket braces are softer than the intrinsic one. And this is because the very high energy photons of asynchrotron picket braces, by interacting with the low energy photons of the EBL, they produce electron positron pairs. And as a consequence, the observed spectra appears softer than the intrinsic one. And so if we just 
assume a limit to the hard intrinsic hardness of the spectra. By comparing this with the observed one, we can infer the properties on the maximum level of absorption of the EBL and also on the density of the EBL itself. So I hope I convinced you such sources are <laughs> very interesting, therefore they represent a tiny fraction of sources in the universe, but as I said before, they are strong gamma ray emitters. In fact, if we look at the gamma ray sky, so in general, let's look at the gamma ray sky, blazers represent the most numerous sources emitting at gamma rays. So just for those who are not familiar, this is uh, the Fermi satellite, which is uh, a gamma ray ob uh, observatory, uh, the large area telescope on board the Fermi satellite, which is operating from 2008, and is an observatory operating in some remote. Uh, it scans the sky in uh, more or less three hours, and uh, it operates in an energy range between uh, 20 MeV and up to 300 GV, with an angular resolution of roughly 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degrees. And various catalogs were produced since the satellite was launched. Now, the re re most recent one is the free FGL, um, which contains more than 3,000 sources, and most of them are blazers. Now, there also is the 4FGL, I think just a preliminary version of the 4GL. is now available, but it will come soon, of course. And as I said before, by looking at all of these sources, the vast majority of them are blazers, and most of such blazers are of high synchrotron picket type. So, as we mentioned during the, in the first slide, blazers are radial out objects, so they show a strong radio emission. But as we are seeing here, they also have a prominent gamma ray emission. So, it's very important to look if is there any possible connection between those two emitting beds. And so, this is the question: if, is there any possible connection? Why is is that important? So it's important for a number of reasons. Uh, for example, it's important to discern among the emission models we mentioned before, synchrotron self compton or external compton models. It's important to obtain indication on the location of the gamma ray emission region with respect to the radio emission region. It's important for obtaining, for example, information on the EBL absorption and on the EBL density, as well as it's important to, uh, for, for the blazer secrets and so on. So, for a number of reasons, it's very important to understand if is there any possible connection between radio emission and gamma ray emission. The answer to this question is yes. There is a strong and significant connection, correlation between those two emitting bands. This kind of connection was explored in several works. Uh, here I just mentioned about one of these works, which is the works of Ackerman et al. 2011, which actually is uh, one of the most complete works in this uh, sense. In this work, the authors used the sample of the first uh, catalog of AGS, the 1FGL, and they use at radio frequencies both 8 GHz archival data and uh, 15 gigahertz concurrent observation by a single dish telescope, which is the Ovo telescope, the radio telescope in Owens Valley. And for assessing the correlation, the significance of the correlation, they use a dedicated method, which is this one, and we're going to talk uh, more detail about this method in the next slides. And what I find is that there is a strong and significant correlation between radio emission and between gamma ray emission in the energy range between 100 MeV and 100 GV. In this plot, the authors show the correlation coefficient versus the energy band, and the different colors here indicate the different blazer subclasses we introduced before, uh, BLA, transpector radio blazers, and LSP, HP, and ESP. Now it's not important to understand which one is the subclass. This, is, this plot is just to show you that the strength of the correlation has a different behavior according to different things. For example, according to the blazer subclass that we are considering, it's also important to take into account the simultaneity observation. So what the authors find in this work is that when they use simultaneous concurrent observation, the correlation that they find is even stronger. And this is because, in, at least for blazers, which are very variable sources, as we said before, it's very important to use, in this case, for such kind of comparison, concurrent observations. And another important thing is that the strength of the correlation depends, as you can see here, on the energy band. What I find is that 
at the when considering the higher gamma ray energies up to 100 GV, the, the strength of the correlation tends to become weaker, at least up to 100 GV. This is what we are interested on now, and we are just curious to see what does it happen when we consider even more higher gamma ray energies. So this strong and very nice correlation still holds when higher gamma rays are considered, so gamma rays above 10 GV, which are very high energy gamma rays. So this is the new question. Again, we are asking this question because it's important to understand the physics acting at the base of the such sources. Before the answer was yes, now the answer is we don't know, it's not easy and straightforward to look for such kind of connection. This is mainly because of the lack of our homogeneous coverage of the sky above 100 GV. And this is mainly due to the operational mode of telescopes operating in such uh, energy range, which are the so-called imaging atmospheric cylindrical telescopes, which are not working like in the case of the Fermi satellite in survey mode of the sky, but they are just working in pointing mode with a limited field of view and a limited observing time. And then with those telescopes, usually they tend to observe sources when such sources are in a peculiar state, so many in failing state. So let's say all of these limitations introduce strong biases in very high energy catalogs. So that's why it's not so easy and straightforward to do a similar uh, correlation study as was done before. Of course, if we wait for CTA with uh, a larger field of view, a larger uh, an improved sensitivity, and hopefully operating in survey mode, we will have the chance to do uh, best work in this sense. But for now, let's see what we have here and what we can use, which is the best resource that we can use to explore such kind of connection between radio emission and very high energy. The Fermi collaboration also produced a couple of catalogs of sources detected above 10 GV and above 50 GVs, which actually are good catalogs for exploring such kind of connection. Let's start by considering the first catalog, which is the 1FHL, which provides us with a large, deep and unbiased sample of sources in the energy range between 10 GV and 500 GV, which actually is a energy range approaching and partly overlapping with the very high energy domain. So it's fine, it's a good sample of sources that we can use. And uh, this catalog contains uh, more than 500 sources. <coughs> the vast majority of sources are AGNs, and the vast majority of those AGNs are blazers. So again, blazers are dominating the census of the gamma ray emission above 10 GV. So again, are the most numerous sources. Okay, we end up with a sample of uh, 237 sources. Before looking at the scatter plots, let me say that what we are doing with respect to the previous work is considering an higher gamma ray energy band. And the other thing we are introducing now is that at radio frequencies, while in the previous work they just used interferometric or just single dish observations, we are using now high resolution VLBI observations, which are more representative of the innermost regions of the sources where gamma rays are produced. So in principle, we, it's expected to obtain an even higher correlation. And then another thing, so we are going to explore the connection by considering higher gamma ray energies, but for looking how this correlation evolves when moving to higher gamma ray energies, for first we consider this gamma ray energy range, of the VFGL, so from 100 MeV to 300 GV, and so here we expect to find a correlation. And then we consider the 1 FHL catalog above 10 GV just to see how this correlation evolves. Okay, this is the scatter plot. Uh, here we have flux, uh, gamma ray fluxes, and here we have the VLBI flux densities. Okay, here we go. <coughs> the red squares here indicate the low synchroton picket objects while in blue squares we indicate the high synchroton picket objects and in green we have the intermediate one. By looking at this scatter plot, just by high, at the first glance it seems that a correlation is there and it's also strong and this is also what it was expected. Let's see what it happens when we move to a higher gamma ray energy range, so when we consider the 
gamma rays above 10 GPs. Okay, this is the new scatter plot. This is how the correlation evolves. So as you can see, if here a correlation seems to be there and seems to be very nice, when considering a flat a gamma rays above 10 GPs, the correlation seems to vanish, and in particular those red squares are those breaking the correlation. But this is just what we see by high. Now we go to quantify this. Let me say that to quantify the correlation and to assess the statistical significance, the significance we use a dedicated statistical method, which is the same one used for the previous work. And it's a method based on uh, the permutations of luminosities. And for these reasons, here we are only considering those sources for which a redshift measurement is available. And uh, this method takes into account also the various uh, observational biases and distance effects, like the Mount bias, which can both enhance or spoil any kind of correlation. Okay, let's quantify what we just did. These are the results by using this first catalog. In this table, in the first column, we have the Blazard subclass that we are considering for looking for the correlation. Here we have the, the energy range that we are considering. Here now we are only showing the results about the VF gel, so between 100 mV and 300 GV. And here is the correlation coefficient value and uh, the significance, the p value here. So, as you can see, we find a strong and significant correlation when considering the gamma ray energy of the VF gel between 100 mV and 300 GV, which was expected. And in this case, we are finding an even stronger correlation than what was found in the previous work. And for sure, one of the effects producing such kind of behavior is that we are using VNBI radio observations, which are more suitable for such kind of comparison. And we find a strong correlation both when we consider the full sample and when, and sorry, and also when we consider the various subsamples, so both the lags and cross-spectral equations, still strong correlation, and also the three subclasses of high intermediate and asymptotal bigger pieces. Okay, let's see the results for the one FHL, so for gamma ray energies above 10 GPs. Okay, here the situation is very different. As you can see, the, the correlation here totally disappeared for the full sample and also for the various subclasses for, for the lack and transparent radio quasars. But when we look at the spectral subclasses of low synchrotron picket, asynchrotron picket, and high speed, we can see that asynchrotron picket blazers are the only blazer subclass for which we still find a strong, quite strong and significant correlation, also above 10 GV. So that's very nice, that's interesting, because this is the only subclass which has this behavior. And so what we found here is that the strong and significant correlation that we found between radio emission and gamma rays totally vanishes when higher gamma rays are considered, in this case, above 10 GV, with the exception of asynchronous picket blazers. Now, later, of course, we will try to explain this, this behavior. The other catalog which allows, allows us to make such kind of analysis is the second catalog of uh, uh, sources detected above 50 GVs. This is even more suitable than the other one because it provides us with a good sem a large sample of sources in the energy range between 50 GV and 2 TV. So we are very happy with this uh, energy range for doing our kind of connection. And this catalog uh, contains uh, 360 sources. And again, the vast majority of them are AGNs. And the vast majority of AGNs, again, are blazers, which are dominating, again, the gamma ray sky above 50 GBs. OK, we are ready with this new catalog. Here we select a sample. Uh, we end up with a sample of 131 sources. And this is the scatter plot of uh, 43 FGL energy range from 100 PV up to 300 GV. And this is the energy range above 50 GVs. Again, in that case, we have low synchrotron picket blazers, and in blue squares, we have high synchrotron picket blazers, and in green, in intermediate plus. Again, as you can see here, there seems to be a nice correlation here, 
and this correlation seems to disappear when we go above 50 GBs. This is what we see in the scattered plots. Let's see, let's quantify such situation now. Okay. Let me say that for, uh, in the case of the second catalog, we were not able to look for the possible connection for all of the Blazor subclasses because in some cases there were few sources. So mm, let's say in some cases there were less than 20 objects in the subclass. So it's a number which is not statistical for significant for obtaining such kind of connection. We were able to perform such kind of correlation for the full sample and for BLX and isochronic with blazers. So again, what we find here is that when considering the free FGL energy fluxes, uh, fluxes, we find a strong and significant correlation for the full sample for BLX and for HPs. But when we go above 50 GBs, again, the correlation here totally disappear for the full sample and for BLX. And again, I think complicated blazers are still showing a strong and significant correlation, also in this energy band up to 2 TVs. As I mentioned before, we are using a method based on the permutation of luminosities for assessing the statistical significance, and for this we are only using here those sources with, for which a redshift measurement is available. In the case of isynchronous picket blazers, a redshift is available here only for about half of them. What we did was just to include also those sources without any redshift estimation by assigning a value, uh, by selecting this value, by randomly selecting this value from those objects which has a redshift. And in this way, what we did, what we have here is of course a number which is double, a double number of sources by including such sources with no redshift. And we obtain again a strong and significant correlation also in this case. Okay. That was uh, the nice uh, result that we found. Just by summarizing, because we did too many numbers here, so the strong and significant correlation between radio and gamma ray emission totally vanishes when higher gamma rays are considered, with the exception of isochrome picket blazers. How can we explain this? We try to give an interpretation of such behavior of the correlation when moving to higher gamma ray energies by looking at the properties of the spectral energy distribution of blazers. In this sketch, uh, representing the SEDs of the three uh, subclasses that we introduced before, low synchrotron picket, high synchrotron picket, and, uh, uh, sorry, low synchrotron picket, intermediate, and high synchrotron picket blazers. And this green line here, so this green area here represents the Fermi energy range, so let's say the free FGL energy range, so the full energy range, while these two li dotted lines represent the threshold of the one FHL above 10 GB and of the second FHL above 50 GBs. Okay, if we look at the <coughs> low synchrotron picket blazers, which are the most powerful uh, ones, they have uh, high energy uh, gamma ray spectra which are softer than the high synchrotron picket ones. And as you can see from this uh, cartoon here, the high synchrotron picket uh, component of low synchrotron blazers is speaking at energies which are lower than those sampled by the Fermi satellite. And so we are sampling here the part of the spectrum which is strongly decreasing mainly because of the cooling uh, of the cooling losses. And this effect is much more important when we consider the 1FHL and 2FHL, where we are limited to the highest uh, part of the spectrum, where the stippling is really severe. Why, in the case of the weaker objects, which are those of high synchrotron picket type, energy losses here are less severe, and uh, the high energy peak here in general, in such a, in such class of sources, is found above 10 GV. So anyway, what we are sampling here in the Fermi energy range is the rising part of the spectrum. Both when we consider the free FHL and the 1 and 2 FHL energy ranges. And so in this case, the part of the spectrum which is affected by cooling losses is well beyond the energy range sampled by Fermi. 
So this is a very simple, um, how do you say, uh, sampling effect that is in good agreement with the results that we found and can explain the reason why isynchrotron picket blazers represents the only blazer subclass for which we still find a strong and significant correlation also in the very energy domain. <coughs> of course, as I mentioned before, this is a good estimate, but there are some caveats to be taken into account. For example, for an even more significant uh, analysis, the, best, the ideal thing is to consider concurrent observation in both emission bands. So in our case, we are considering just archival VLBI observations and the gamma ray data provided by uh, the Fermi catalog. So as we said, blazers are very variable sources. So if in the future we can use uh, concurrent data, of course, that would be much more suitable, that would be ideal and perfect. And uh, I will conclude here. I think it's, uh, yes, it's done. Let me just summarize what we did. Um, we found that this correlation totally vanishes when going to higher uh, gamma ray energies, and we explain this uh, by looking at the spectral energy distribution properties, because isynchronous picket blazers are the only class of sources still showing such uh, connection. And I hope I convinced you that isynchronous picket blazers, although they are a very small, represent a very small fraction of blazers and of AGS in general, they are very interesting sources. And uh, if you are interested in such results, of course, today I just talked about a few of the results that we found. We published this paper a few months ago, so you can find additional information there, and or just ask me an hour or later. And I think I stop here, and I thank you very much for listening. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting talk and uh, this new resource. Thank you very much. Um, I, I understood that, uh, I don't know if I followed you well, but uh, I understood the different set distribution for different types. Of laser, but in physical terms, what does they mean? I mean the LSP, I understood that all, <coughs> all of the blazers okay. you are looking to the okay. to the jets in radio, I can imagine. But uh, what we are looking in the in the gamma in the gamma rays in the physical terms, which is the difference between LSP. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks uh, for the question. I didn't introduce such topic, and of course in the paper we mentioned this. So, as I said, this is of course a good and a first result that needs of course to be extensively confirmed by using maybe uh, concurrent data. But anyway, what we can say is for example that for sure in isynchrotron picket blazers, a different emission mechanism is acting, producing the emission with respect to the low synchrotron picket blazers. So, for example, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a different emission mechanisms, for example, the synchronous self Compton, the external Compton model. So, in the case, for example, of the synchronous self Compton, we say that the inverse Compton scattering is occurring with the low energy photons, which are the synchrotron photons itself. And so, if the synchrotron photons are the same one, in the case of a synchrotron self Compton, we expect to find a strong correlation between the radio and gamma ray emission. And so what we can say is that in isynchrotron picket blazers, mainly the main mechanism responsible of the observed emission is the synchrotron self Compton, while in the low synchrotron picket blazers, maybe the external Compton play a dominant role in such sense. So this is the physical interpretation that we can give. Yeah, you mentioned that for this HSP sources, that they have peculiar VLBI structures in the sense that uh, they, sh they show that there is no reported superluminal motion yeah. and also mentioned that there is such brightening. Yeah. And my question is, in the case of the LSPs, uh, I mean, 
it could it be that the edge brightening is in all the sources that, but you cannot detect them in the LSPs because of dynamic range, because there you have uh, some features in, in the jet that are moving supernominally? Yeah, or yeah. this is intrinsic? I, I think that's, it, it's not intrinsic because limb brightening is also observed in low synchrotron picket yeah. laser, so I think so yeah. I can confirm this. So yeah, I, I just, uh, I also have, I think, some image just to show. Okay, this is one of SP sources. This is a limb writing that we observe now, both in total intensity, also in polarizing emission, <coughs> and also a transverse structure of the EVPAs. That, but I think, yeah, it's not just an intrinsic property, but it's just most commonly observed in... It's the present of having a feature less or a, or a general yeah. feature. Not taking into account. So, no. do you think that that can have an impact on the? Yes, of course. This operation. is another thing that can have an impact to mm -hmm. the result that we obtain, together with the fact that they are not concurrent. So, it's one of the caveats to be taken into account. Mm -hmm. But it's not taken into account here. Okay. So, there is well, there may be some. Yeah. Of course. In that. Yeah. So, and, and the second question is. Uh, Regarding the, the explanation for the correlation or correlation of different kinds of uh, lasers. Um, so the main argument that you are using is, uh, is uh, let's say, the, the region in the, in the gamma ray spectrum that uh, uh, the Fermi light is, is, uh, is measured on every kind of source and so on. And uh, as far as I understood, what, the, the, what, you, what, you, what you use for explaining the, the non-correlation of uh, LSPs is that you are in the decline uh, yeah. uh, region of the, of the, of the spectrum. So we have lost so these photons. Energy losses, strong energy losses and so on. But you still <coughs> are detecting a lot of lags in that region. Mm -hmm. And even if, if I mean, my understanding is that even if you if you are in the declining uh, region of the, of the spectrum, you start you still have a, a lot of a lot of emission. Yes. Even if it's absorbed. Yeah. Uh, you would expect some kind of uh, of uh, of uh, correlation with the low uh, energy spectrum if there is such a correlation. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I mean is that you, I understand that that. Uh, uh, energy losses by uh, by themselves alone cannot cannot explain the lack of correlation. It should be another reason, like yeah. as you have mentioned already, the a different mechanism different mission. for the yeah, for yeah, the emission. Yeah. So I find more let's say more um, reasonable to to use the main cause for the non correlation uh, as the different emission the mechanism. Different emission mechanism okay. Like yeah. um, let's say um, yeah, you have mentioned that uh, uh, sub synchrotron uh, emission against after the uh, next uh, time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I have a curiosity about uh, the catalog you we are using for the high energies. Is it possible to to work out the variability um, the variability of this in this high energy? with the data you have on because maybe this can explain something, this, uh, this difference which you know, Yes. Yes, yes. This can also be something else uh, contributing to this because variability <coughs> is even more higher at even more higher gamma rays yeah. and uh, yeah, in principle it's possible to estimate the variability and for sure, as you mentioned, can play a role to such kind of uh, observed behavior in the correlation, which, as I said before, is not very easy to interpret because there are several uh, things contributing to the observed results, like the variability, and like the EVL absorptions, and like the 
So that, that's why it's not easy to manage this, but at least now this is a strong result with <coughs> what we can do now, is the best we can do now. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of uh, comments. Uh, you know the, the fundamental play of uh, black hole activity uh, relates to the uh, X-rays coming from the creation disk in the radio, coming from the jet. Mm -hmm. So there is a clear, clear connection between the, the, the creation rate and the jet production. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that established the, clearly this connection ray, uh, between radio and X-rays for, for the low big uh, syn synchrotron sources you do find that correlation, and uh, even for high speed, high, high uh, HSP, so low uh, high energy gamma rays show this clear connection, which, you know, is, is in agreement with the, uh, what the X-rays are also showing. So the whole thing is connected to creation, jet production, and so on. So what, what, what it's, it's, it's really uh, quite surprising that when you go to very high energies, mm -hmm. uh, only the HSPs show that correlation. So the HSPs, that seems to be correlated between the gamma rays, equation, radio, and so on. So what, what, what is producing this break for a low, low synchrotron peak source is, 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 it should be perhaps a, a different uh, a connection between the gamma ray production and, and the jet. So it's like uh, the gamma rays are not associated with the, with, the, with the radius or with the jet. Yep. So do you have any idea of what may be the source for the gamma rays if they are not actually connected with the jet? I can just say in general that maybe we there are much more external photons in, in LSP than I see the picket blazers, which may produce gamma rays through the external Compton model. And so while in I see the picket blazers, most of the low energy photons of the yeah, but still, but it's still the, the, the electrons are coming from the Yeah, I, I, so, so it's, it's not very easy, so I, I cannot understand, yeah. yes, that it's, it's not easy to, to manage this. So I don't have a clear idea of how, how to explain this mm -hmm. in these terms. And also connection uh, between the fundamental plane of black hole activity and the blazer sequence. So we know that uh, the higher black, black hole mass, the higher the produ production in, involving radio in east rays. So do you think that this also applies for the blazer sequence? Uh, Is there any correlation between the black hole mass of low peak and high peak? I don't know. I didn't check about that. I don't know if are there are any works on this, but I, I will check. But okay, um, from what I know, how do you calculate the black hole mass in the uh, In general, you mean? So there are several uh, ways for doing this. Uh, we use in general the reverberation mapping for. Yes, but you need lines. But I will need lines, yes. In fact, uh, the mass estimation is much more uncertain for BLX just for, for this reason. But it's also the end sigma correlation. Mm -hmm. So, the end sigma, end sigma correlation. So, there's a correlation between the, the motion of the gas yeah, uh, okay. and the whole mass. You need lines to calculate. No, but that's in the case that you only have the continuum. Yeah, but, but, but how, how, how you, can you estimate this? Well, in my logic is very good on this, on this uh, topic, but uh, as far as I understood, uh, with the, with the, it's not uh, an easy task to calculate this. It is not. It's, uh, yeah, it's not. Because you, you don't have plans, yes. you are completely lost. Yeah, masses are very uncertain, mainly in isocotomic basis. So I, I didn't touch this topic, but it's not easy to obtain the estimating the mass. Yeah. No comments, questions? Thank you very much. For Thank you. Thank you.